Hello, in this video I'm going to be going through the 2023 HSC or Year 12 mid-course review. So this is a test that we do at the um, uh, towards the end of Term 1 and uh, this is covering only the mechanics or the mathematics component of civil structures and uh, transport. It is a 30 mark test, it took about 50 minutes, it might be 45 minutes next time around. Um, Okay, so first of all, what we have is a six meter beam, and we've been asked to draw a shear force diagram. Um, I drew up a new shear force diagram. I spent a lot of time drawing that on um, uh, Illustrator and uh, Photoshop. You might not look it, but anyway. Um, okay, so I will be honest, and I will say that I did this exam while I was supervising the exam, just because I've got to come up with some answers. And um, I did not draw this exam properly. I, I, I did not answer this properly. I am not going to show you my original answer, but I will say that roughly the bending moment diagram, I drew like that. I drew it um, in reverse. Um, now, the reason for that is I did, it didn't write it. Oh, I've cropped just one second. If I uncrop, there should be a little bit more. Ah, there is a, that's 15, but I've, when I've pasted my picture in, I've taken out the 15. So it's minus 15. Just remember if it's minus, it means the diagram goes down. And so I was doing this fairly quickly. I was supervising people going to the bathroom, answering questions and handing out pens, um, or that sort of thing. Um, anyway, and it wasn't until I was walking around after I'd finished the exam, it's like, ah, oh, it is shaped like that. So um, what would I have lost? I would have lost one out of five marks because when I, um, I've i marked twice the um, at the HSC level uh, questions of bending moment diagrams, and without you know saying explicitly, I would say it's pretty reasonable to say that as long as you're getting, say, two um, two points on the diagram more or less correct, you, um, the, the general shape is there, and just simply starting and finishing at zero, is going to go a part of the way. So just understanding the bending moment diagram always starts and finishes at zero, shear force diagram always starts and finishes at zero, is actually quite helpful. And then um, the fact that I've got the quantity of 15 kilonewtons, I've understood that. Even then, if I went and drew the rest of it wrong, I'm still going to get one out of the two marks that I'd probably get for that bending moment diagram. Um, I've shown my working out here, which is that this is 15 plus 6 um, times 2 is, it looks like 12 because that dash is there, but it's actually times 2 because it's times 2. So this is 15 times 1, minus 15 times 1 gives us minus 15. Uh, I should have written a, a minus sign there, but so I've got minus 15 plus 6, and it's a positive 6, not a negative 6, times 2, and you can see that's 2, so minus 15 plus 12 effectively is minus 3, so that's where we get to minus 3. Are we all good there? Okay. So then um, something worth noting is that it's symmetrical. So because it's symmetrical, so there's no marks effective, or there's maybe one mark for finding the reactions. Effectively, I expect that you can add these up and say it's 42. 42 divided by 2 is going to be 21 each, and you should be able to get to that number quite quickly. So um, there's probably... I would say effectively there's one mark for finding the reactions, um, one mark for doing something right in the shear force diagram. If you just drew some orthogonal boxes, as long as you start and finish at zero, and ideally if you had one one number right, but even just have, showing orthogonal boxes that start and finish at zero, boom, I'm going to give you one mark. Um, then if it's correct, I'm going to give you two marks. Here the same thing, as long as I can see that it's, you've understood it's um, diagonal lines, start and finish at zero, you're probably going to get one mark. Um, if you didn't finish it, start and finish at zero, but you had two points correct on the diagram, you're going to get one mark, um, and it's an extra mark for getting three. So, um, okay, moving on. For a different load configuration, uh, we've got a beam that is 100 meters by 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters. It has a second moment of area of um, 8.3 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the power of 4, and it has bending moment of 30 kilonewton meters. Okay, so I've started with, remember that the second most important thing you need to know in this subject is that stress equals force over area, but rule 2B is for bending, and so that means you have to remember that bending stress is my, my over Y. So bending stress is my over I. M 
is the maximum bending moment, which was provided for us. I did that, so rather than having us read off this diagram above, I don't want to have a carried error. So by me saying the bending moment, the maximum bending moment here, so in this case, our maximum bending moment is 15, 15 kilonewton meters. It's absolute value. We don't care about if it's ma um, positive or, or negative. Especially if it's steel, if it's a steel beam, um, then steel and timber, generally, we don't care if it's positive or negative. It's different if it's concrete, but that's more complicated than the course really goes into. So um, I just specify this, so that way there's no confusion. It's very clear that the maximum bending moment is 30 kilonewton meters. But if we had to take it off the diagram, that would be the value we'd be looking at. The I value, or the second moment of area, also sometimes called the moment of inertia, is always given um, is always given now most situations I'd say nine out of ten times in the HSC it's given as 10 to the 6 millimeters to the power of 4 occasionally you'll see it as negative 10 to the 6 meters to the power of 4 you have to then do conversions right and those conversions are a bit of a pain so I would say Whatever they give you is what you use. Because the default, and the default in the industry, I, I have my red book over there, which um, shows the, the second moment of area of like steel sections. They will be provided for you because you're not going to come up with a new steel section. You're going to use the steel sections that are you know, sold by the, uh, the fabrication place. Um, they will give it in millimeters to the power of four. So you should do everything in millimeters. So remember, we go together like mil megapascals and millimeters squared. I had my first year that I, I taught at, at this school. They um, they like to reverse it. So anyway, um, anyway, so millimeter squared and megapascals. I don't know. Okay, so here we can see. So I've written this as the bending moment as. Do you see how I've written it as thirty times ten to the six newton millimeters? So we should always be using SI units, but the one exception is millimeters and megapascals. So, and even then, we're going to see later that we only use millimeters when we're also using megapascals. If you're not using a combination of the two, you should always be using base SI units. So, 10 to the 6, we, um, now, by this stage, I've said this enough in class, that a kilonewton meter, there's a thousand newtons in a kilonewton, and there's a thousand millimeters in a meter, so a thousand times a thousand is six zeros, a million, right? So it's 10 to the six newton millimeters. The 8.3 times 10 to the six millimeters to the power of four. And then our y value, I expect you to be able to calculate the y value. I've made it pretty easy by making it a square section. You can't really get it wrong. You just have to know that the depth of the section is 100 millimeters. Half of 100 millimeters is 50 millimeters. And that gives us our y value. This is the distance from the neutral axis to the extreme fiber. I remember being at uni and thinking that this y was a very nebulous concept, but the name of y is the distance from the neutral axis to the extreme fiber. I talk about how, you know, if I have a band, I might call an out, name one of my albums the distance from the neutral axis to the extreme fiber. You can have that, right? If any of you ever have a band, you're welcome to that title. Okay. Um, I will be proud to see that one day on, uh, the shells at JB Hi-Fi. Okay, so we plug those numbers in. We have 30 times 10 to the 6 times 50 divided by 8.3 times 10 to the 6. You'll notice the 10 to the 6 is cross out, right? And that makes our maths actually quite reasonable. We can, we can do sort of even quick maths. We can say 3 times 5 is 150, is, sorry, is, is, is 15, 15 plus 2 zeros, so we're going to get 15,000, right? We divide it by 8. We're going to get a number that's about 150, right? And we look at it, it's like, yeah, it's about 150. Right, 150 megapascals. Our answer, we're using millimeters, we're getting megapascals. Right, we go together like megapascals and millimeters squared. Okay, question two. The diagram depicts um, a bicycle drive mechanism. Uh, we see lots of these questions. I There was talk before the exam about having um, the force be in an angle. Um, I didn't do that. I thought about it. People is watching this video, right, especially if you're doing the, the HSC in 2024, right, you might want to think about preparing for that, but, you know, maybe not. Um, so those people, I just also say, they might want to think about pulleys. I was really think tempted when I wrote this question to include pulleys. It's like, but I have I explicitly taught pulleys in this unit and say, oh, maybe not, maybe not. Maybe. Now, I think that this is a great, like this and pulleys are kind of interchangeable. Obviously, this has a, this question has gears um, or if they just give diameters of belts, um, these are all ways that we can um, talk about uh, 
being able to predict the velocity ratio of things just by looking at the dimensions or looking at in, inspecting a pulley, for example. Okay, so what have we said? First of all, I've only asked for the velocity ratio. Often I ask for the efficiency of the system, but because I didn't have enough marks to play with, I, it's only a short paper, I didn't have enough marks, and this is the part that I'm interested in. Velocity ratio is the hard part. So what are we looking at? The diff distance between um, the well, so we've got the distance traveled by the effort divided by the distance traveled by the load. Obviously, this is in the formula sheet, the, this formula. Um, what they don't include is they don't include this. Um, now, Copeland, he writes his formula as little d divided by big D um, times n rev. And so n rev is part of the denominator. Um, I, a student last year introduced me to this formula, and I actually really like this formula. I think because it... I have two ways of approaching it. One is that I like the idea that we can just simply measure the distance traveled by this pedal. So the distance traveled by this pedal is going to be the circumference of the circle. 170 times 2 times pi. That's the distance traveled by the pedal. Now, every time we turn the pedal, right, we're going to, um, we're going to turn this pedal 40 teeth. If we travel this pedal 40 teeth, by the time we've gone 20 teeth, half the circle, the big wheel is going to turn around once. By the time we've done a full revolution of the pedal, the big wheel will have gone around 40 teeth, which is two revolutions, right? So when we write n rev, n rev is number of revolutions. That's what it stands for. So when we see n rev, it's how many times has the big wheel spun around? Now, if you write that as, so what is the diameter of the small circle? The difference between these two things, you can see here I've written a pi, right? That pi, so those two pi's, they're on both sides, so they cancel out. So we don't need to worry about pi. You can ignore pi. And we can just compare the two diameters. Or you can compare radiuses. But I would rather compare diameters because it's just I like diameters. In, in engineering, we should be using diameters in our equations. So we've got 70 times 2 um, times uh, 70 times 2 divided by 70, and then we've got the n rev component. Now, if we have gears, the velocity ratio for gears is driven over driver. So I like to think if you really were unhappy with the Star Wars sequels, you didn't like Kylo Ren, and you see Adam Driver on the street, and you, you, you get in your car and... Eah! Bump, right now that visual image of someone who has driven over adam driver also if you remember norgate i have a picture of the norgate so nor gives you the n for driven and the r for driver driven over driver and that's what the n and r for it's driven over driver right and then you've got to actually think you've got to stop and say which of these is actually being driven and one which one's the driver the driver is the pedal the pedal is the driver and the big wheel is being driven by that pedal, right? So let's have a look. So we've got driven over driver. Driven is 20 teeth. Driver is 40 teeth. So we've got 20 over 40. Now, as it happens, these two things cancel out quite quickly. We can say, what's 17 over um, 17 over 700? I can't do that in my head. Sorry, 170 over 700. But what I can do is I can say, well, that's going to be this pretty close to 15 over um 15 over 60. 15 over 60 is about a quarter, right? And our answer is about a quarter. I did ask for some crazy, re re what it was is I changed velocity ratio and didn't change this thing. I wrote it as a percentage. So technically the answer there is 24.3, right? It's a three decimal places, right? Um, 24 rounds up to three. Uh, if you wrote 24%, I gave that, I, I told the class while they were doing the exam that if you wrote 24%, um, I give that correct. If you wrote it as this, I would ignore that you wrote the percentage. I'm not taking any marks off of that, as long as you understood the concept. But sometimes we do change around those numbers, and it's possible that we could see, ask for a velocity ratio as a percentage. Typically, we ask for it as a decimal, and I, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect you 12 students to be able to convert a decimal to a percentage. Okay, moving on. Um, that was two marks, presumably. I think I've removed the marks because I scanned in this picture. Um, but I'm pretty sure there's two marks. Um, okay, so now we've got an equals flea question. Um, a steel section under load 700, the allowable strain. So here... Just because I didn't want people to get confused, I explained that 25% is the same as 0 0.025. Almost that would like that would be helpful to this person here, right? Um, okay, so the Young's modulus is given in gigapascals, 2110. So that's the Young's modulus for mild steel, right? You might be able to recognize that number. That can be helpful. Um, calculate the area of steel required. So first of all, I wrote down E equals flea. Therefore, I can rewrite that. I know that the vowels can be swapped, 
right? So A, E, uh, A and the E's can all be swapped. And then I started writing it out and I wrote, so force equals 700, L equals, oh, I don't, they haven't given me a length. Now, what some people do is they look at the L and they don't know what the L stands for. And they think, oh, L might be for load. No, no. In this case, L is for original length. At uni, they'll write L with a little subscript zero for original length. Now, so instead, what we have to know is that stress equals, sorry, Young's modulus of elasticity equals stress over strain. Right. Now, they have, the, I can rewrite that formula. I can rewrite that formula and then say, well, okay, so if I rewrite that formula, I can swap the, um, the E's, but, what I've done is I've rewritten that formula here. So this is stress, and then I've multiplied that by strain. So therefore, I can write A equals, in this case, I'm swapping out the, the. this is algebra. I expect you should be able to do algebra. If you can't do algebra in year 12, let me know, and we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. Okay, and then I, my known values are that the Young's modulus, I because we've got millimeters and, and pascals, we want to use millimeters and megapascals. So gigapascals are in fact a thousand megapascals. So I've written two times 10 to the three megapascals. The strain is 0 0.025 because we want to use a number, not a percentage. So we can then say area equals 700 divided by this big thing. That gives us 700 divided by 525, which equals 1.3. Now, normally I wouldn't write 700 divided by 5.5, but I was using my, um, my phone as a calculator while I was supervising this. And, um, I needed to store the number somewhere and I didn't have memory function, so um, I didn't have the answer button. So I, I, But the advantage of writing it down there is I can say, hey, 7 divided by 5 is going to be about 1.3. 7 divided by 5 is going to be a number bigger than 1 but less than 2. And that gives me my answer. I'm like, yeah, I'm happy with that. Remember, these answers should always be very small. Um, okay. Now, this is a familiar question. Was anyone surprised to see this boat question? I don't always include the picture of the boat. One, one year I had the, um, the tram because I'd just been to Hong Kong and I thought, oh, yeah, well, they, they've got a, a tram that's it's actually being um, pulled. It's actually a, a funicular, which means a tram that's being pulled by a rope. Um, anyway, so um, what do they call it? The peak tram or something like that. Anyway, so I wrote my formula, too many guys formula, which you might be familiar with. Better than the too many guys formula is actually extending the formula out. If you write the full formula, that's probably going to be better for the markers. That's probably going to be closer to what the HSC answers will be for things. But if you use the too many guys formula, that will work and you won't lose any marks. The key is here always whether or not you use um, positive or negative in your answer. Now, in this case, I made it very clear, calculate the minimum force required in the um, required in the winch cable. Uh, okay, so it should have been required to winch the cable up the ramp. To winch the cable up the ramp. I'll have to change that in my... Uh, my, my new version of this formula. Two winch. I, I did explain it when I was reading uh, to the class that, yeah, it's, it's not stationary. I did actually say to the people doing the exam, it's, a, we don't want to hold it stationary. We do actually want to move it v towards the, the, um, towards the trailer. Um, yeah. Sorry. It's true that when you write a paper on your own, I'm the only teacher who teaches this. There's no one else who proofreads them. Um, I have to proofread them. Unfortunately, I make errors. Luckily, I'm able to explain those errors as we're doing the exam. So, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, I've said mg equals 1600 times 10, right, which I have just done in one jump. I've, so that would be 16,000 newtons. I've then just written as 16 kilonewtons or 16,000 newtons. Okay, so I've said 16,000 newtons sine 20 plus 16,000 newtons um, times 0. 0.6, which is coefficient of friction, cos 20, gives me that number plus that number equals um, 14. Now, if... If I had said that um, it was to keep it stationary, what would the, the tension in the cable be? Sorry? You said it'd be negative? You do minus, but you can't have... So remember, you've got to remember that the friction force is a reaction force. A reaction force can never be greater than the force. You can never have friction suddenly move something. You know, you had a heavy object and suddenly the friction actually causes it to move. That would be crazy, right? Friction is a reaction force. It's like your chair never just suddenly pushes you up, right? The chair, it will take an increasing load, but it's always, it's like a really good cop who only escalates the amount of force to defend themselves. It never actually, you know, goes overboard and, you know, beats the person up once they've given up, right? It's a good cop, not a bad cop, right? So, 
In that case, the tension in the rope would be zero. But that's a really hard question, right? The question, the rope and the question being zero, and that's probably harder. If we got an answer where it was negative in the HSC, I would say, did Punzit write this or did, you know, a team of people who presumably proofread this and checked this write this question? Because giving the answer of zero is pretty hard, right? So, um, you know, I say that now so that in case next year I forget and make a silly mistake and I do give you an answer of zero, you're like, Hunza did say that one of the videos. Okay, um, so a block of 30 kilograms rests on surface, uh, coefficient of friction of four. I, I had several students who remembered the phony friction formula, but they couldn't tell if it was plus or minus. The fact is that because we're making the box lighter, we're reducing the weight or the normal reaction. Right, we're actually not reducing the mass of the object or the weight of the object. What we're doing is reducing the normal reaction. So you've got to think about, well, the normal reaction is normally going to be 300, kil 300 newtons, but because we're lifting it, we're going to make the thing lighter. So remember, the phony friction formula is just F equals mu N, except we replaced F with pH, and we replaced N with this bracket. So what we're doing is we're making N lighter, so it should be a minus. Okay, um, for the p-values, um, pH and PV, I've just used P at 30 degrees, pretty much my go-to. I'd be very surprised if I ever gave you a, um, a box, a bear in a box question that wasn't 30 degrees. Uh, it's just not my thing. So um, you probably should expect those values. So I've just written those values there so you can see where these substitutions have come in. So I've got pH, pH is 0.866 multiplied by 0.4 times 300, which is um, the weight of the box. I've expanded the brackets. That's what I've done here. I've expanded the brackets because sometimes people forget they have to expand mu times mg and mu times pv. Sometimes people forget. So in this particular case, I thought I would expand the brackets just to make it really clear what was going on. So 0.4 times that minus 0.4 times that. And because it's half, I just know I know what half of 0.4 is. I can do that in my head. Half of 0.4 is 0.2. Just you got to remember it's minus 0.2. So to get rid of it, I have to plus 0.2 to both sides. Do you see how plus plus 0.2 to both sides? Another common error. Even for me, that's a common error, right? Sometimes I do these on the board and I make that mistake. That's why I wrote it down on the paper so I didn't make the mistake. So I get 1.066 equals 120. Um, so therefore, if I know that 0.11 pineapples equals 100, it costs 120 dollars. Imagine this is an expensive pineapple, and that 1.1 pineapples is 120 bucks. Well, how much is it just a whole pineapple going to be? It's going to be slightly less, right? So it's going to be slightly less than 120. That that to me helps me to remember it. So this is where I have a um, a meme from one of my previous years, which was how many pineapples. Um, okay. This question here is just a, a take on our very, very common bike question, where we see a bike on the top of the hill, and we say, how fast will the bike be going at the bottom of the hill? This is from a, a past HSC question, where they asked you to calculate the height instead. And I thought that was a good question, but I thought, well, that was maybe a little too hard for you guys. You know, I, I just thought I wanted to make sure that my questions were fair and that everyone had a reasonable chance of getting them. So I thought, you know what? We'll bring it back to just a nice, easy bike question. What it is, it's a bike. We have to figure out how fast it's going to be going um, given the change in height. Normally, this, the change in height that we have to calculate, we have to use some trigonometry to calculate the height of uh, the... Because keep in mind, we don't care about the length of the run of the bike. We care about how high the bike is. The change in vertical height is what matters. And so here, it's really easy. We can see the change in vertical height is h, except I saw several people who wrote the height as being 2.5 instead of 1.5. They didn't appreciate it's a change in vertical height, not the absolute vertical height. You've got to remember that vertical height's all relative to a reference point. We're not measuring from the center of the Earth. Right? If we're measuring from the center of Earth, it would be a much bigger number. So... Um, the change in height, so, and I tried to even make that clear, 2m plus h equals, I, I don't know, I, I did what I could I, I, to, to make it as clear as possible. Um, okay, so what we've got to start off with is kinetic energy equals potential energy, half mv squared, which is on the formula sheet, equals mgh. Now, just remember that when we're talking about potential energy, we're actually talking about gravitational potential energy. When we're talking about gravitational potential energy, the height is change in vertical height only. Yeah, it's really want to make that clear. We're talking about the gravi change in gravitational potential energy is equal to the change in vertical height. Otherwise, we just say this is exactly the same as Fs, right? 
if the force is mg, right, the force is equal to the weight, which is mg, and the displacement is s, right? In this case, they're making it really clear by writing mgh, what they're saying is we know that we're talking about weights. Weights are gravi applied by gravity. Gra when we're talking about gravity, we're talking about distance from the center of the Earth or vertical height, yeah? Okay, I really dragged that on home. Okay, first of all, what we can do is we can say those two things are equal. We can cross out the M, M was on both sides, so we can cross it out. So therefore, we can say half V squared equals GH, which we've done this so many times, I've just simplified that to V equals the square root of 2GH. Two two we've seen this so many times now that, you know, that should be quite familiar. Okay, so I say V equals um, 2 times 10 times the change in vertical height, 0. 0.5, which we see the 2 and the 0. 0.5 cancel out, so it's the square root of 10. Right, square root of 10, I know is going to be about 3, right, a bit over 3, because I know the square root of 9 is 3, yeah? Okay, so the weight of a, now when I say 10, it's actually 9.8, so it's actually the square root of 9.8. If you wrote the square root of 9.8, that's great, good good for you, I, I, I use 10. Um, okay, the weight of a rider, now this is an interesting question, this is just simply stress equals force over area, but with a couple of steps. Um, the fact that I made this three, I, I, the reason I made this three is because the HSC made these three, right? Um, this is probably, I would say, because I made mine, mine in a little, made it a little tiny bit easier. One of the reasons I didn't like the HSC question is the HSC question, um, it requires you to have the value of x twice in the equation. I thought, ah, oh, like it's achievable, right? You should be able to get it, but it's just a little bit harder algebra. And I just wanted to, I didn't want to be testing algebra. I wanted to sort of highlight, and for people in 2024, you should be prepared to be able to calculate the height rather than the, rather than the velocity. But um, check out, check it out. Uh, I think it's the 2019 HSC, the full working outs there. Okay, but this, I'm pretty sure this question is also from the um, 2019 HSC. I thought it was a good variation on a stress equals force over area question. So what are we looking at? Stress equals force over area. So the force of, why do I write, force of the rider equals 650. Area equals 2 times 12. Now, for some people, they struggled with that. This is the exact wording of the HSC question. I didn't change it, but remember the area between each of the two tires is 100. Uh, so they're just testing your ability to read there, right? The question of each. Uh, anyone who asked, and, and I, because someone asked during the exam, I did say it's each tire. But, um, okay, stress equals 300 kilopascals, which is the same as... We go together like megapascals and millimeters squared. We're using pascals. We're using areas. If we're going to use millimeters, we should use megapascals. So kilopascals, we never, ever, ever use kilopascals. You should either be using pascals or megapascals. In this case, because we're using millimeters, we're going to convert it to megapascals. That is a, a stumbling point for some people. So what I said is the total force equals area times stress, which equals 20, uh, 2,400 times the, um, 0.3, which is 720. Um, Okay, so mg equals fs. We're trying to find, I'm trying to find the mass, or I'm trying to find the weight of the, the scooter. That's what I've said here. I'm trying to find the weight of the scooter. So the weight of the scooter or the force of the scooter, I probably should have written that as a w. That would have been better. The weight of the scooter equals the total weight minus the rider. So we know the total weight is 420, sorry, 720 minus 650. 720 minus 650 is 70. So we know that the total um, weight of the scooter is 70, grand, uh, 70 newtons. I've then said, so mass will equal 70 divided by um, gravity. 70 divided by 9.8 is roughly equal to 7, so 7 kilograms. A lot of people, several people when I was marking this wrote 70, so you lost a mark there. That's probably why this is three marks, because they expect you to do that conversion. The fact that they expect you to read the question and the fact that they expect you to do this component here, the scooter equals um, total weight minus the rider. Okay, now someone wrote 15 times 10 to the 10 kilograms. That is like 150 Titanics. I thought, what is the heaviest thing I could think of? And it's like, you know, there are heavier boats than the Titanic, but Titanic is a good answer. The space station might weigh more than the Titanic, but, you know, I just thought, what was the heaviest thing I could think of? And it's like, the Titanic is probably a good reference point for built structures that people can imagine. It's like, you've, the answer you've written is, more than more than a thousand Titanics. You've got to think that's a very heavy scooter. So the, just try to remember the reason they give you these questions is so you can make an estimate. So that you can say, oh, this answer seems too big. Like 700 kilograms for a scooter is too much. Okay. Even 70 kilograms for a scooter is too much. Okay. 
There was a lot of talk about these questions before um, we got to it. So um, we're heading into the bell, so I'm going to just be quick and say there are plenty of students who calculated the angle and used that angle to find out exactly what the value of um, mg cos theta is. They found out theta and they, they used that. That's fine. Absolutely great. What we need for this question is we've said force uh, power equals force times velocity, force equals mg sine theta plus friction. There's no coefficient of friction, so we're just assuming zero. So we're saying force in this case equals 1200, so mass times gravity, right? Uh, um, 1200 divided by 30. If you did that through using trigonometry, great. Absolutely great. If instead you use this method, I pretty, did pretty detailed working out. So I said mg sine theta um, over mg equals a to c. I label the diagram as a, or here we can see, a, b, c. I said c is actually the square root of 901. Square root of 901 is dangerously close to 30. So it's like 30.01. So I said that therefore, a, it's actually equal to the ratio of a over b. a is 1, therefore mg sine theta equals mg over b, which is 40 right so 40 and then what you need to do is you need to divide um, the velocity so velocity is 45 divided by 3.6 meters per second equals 12.5 40 times 12.5 is 50 okay this question here um, what we need to do here a lot of people got the area wrong I'll be honest I wrote 49 here you can see I wrote 49 silly puns it right I wrote that question and I saw the, the silly mistake but then I remembered it's the ribbon area right the thing I need to find is the thickness so what I said is the area that we're trying to find is going to be the, the area equals the perimeter times the thickness. Often we use capital H for thickness, just a thing, right? So what is the area? I said the area is equal to 30 millimeters squared. That was pretty easy, right? Force, the stress equals force over area. Therefore, area equals force over stress. 300 divided by 10 is 30 millimeters per second. We go together like megapascals and millimeters squared, right? Now, if I know that, um, so the perimeter is um, 7 times 4, because there's 4 sides, 7 times 7, 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7, and um, so there's 4 times the thickness. I said that's 30, and then the, the we've got divided by 28 is going to give us an answer very, very close to 1, right? So it's 1.07, um, uh, and that's in millimeters. I crossed out because I tried to fit my scan onto the page. Okay, last question. So, I think this is fairly easy. First of all, you do not need to find the reactions. Why? Because the cut, when we cut this, all of the stuff that we need is on, uh, that we can remove the reactions because the reactions are on one side. Um, that way, I can save myself heaps of time. The markers expect you to be able to do that. So, I've drawn my cut, and I've only got one force, 40. Oh, boy, this is such an easy truss. Normally, I include a zero force member. So, you know, a lot of people took a punt and wrote zero force. Typically, I, ha I like to include a zero force member. I just couldn't find a good zero force member in this diagram. Okay, so some of the forces about F. Can see how, how do we get rid of these two? Well, we, they both meet at F. So what have we got? I've got 40 is four units away. You're allowed to measure it. It says drawn to scale. So this is two, three, four. If you measured and got some other number, that's fine. I didn't take away marks. So it's 40. The 40 is four units away. It's going anti-clockwise, so it's negative. CD is going clockwise, therefore it's positive, right? We've, we've assumed tension, right? And if it's tension, it's going to be going clockwise about F. So in that case, we can say, well, CD, 40 is four times away from CD. So CD is going to have to be four times bigger in order to balance it. So in my head, I can just see straight away it's 160 and it's going to have to be tension. I don't need to use any calculators. I can just see straight away it's going to be 160 um, tension. Okay, lastly, we have the vertical force. So if we look at this CD and this one, EF, CD and EF, neither of them have any vertical component. So for this to balance, the only thing that has vertical component is CF. How much is the vertical component of CF going to have to be? It's going to have to be 40 up. Right, I just drew a little diagram. I didn't write, write any working out. Diagram is very quick to draw, right? 40 up. If, if the vertical component is 40, then CD has to be bigger than that. Why? Because it's a hypotenuse. The hypotenuse has to always be bigger than the sides. Now, I re rewrote this answer. Part of the reason why we're not just using my original scan, because I made a second silly, silly error mistake, and I wrote 60 degrees. Why? Because I'm just so used to seeing 60 degrees, I wrote 60 degrees. I didn't look and see, oh, of course, it's 45 degrees. Now, what I would lose, I, I might lose a mark for that, right? It's possible, because it's a four-mark question, that the marker might say, look, the student has made one silly mistake. They've, they've just taken the wrong angle. The angle wasn't specified on the drawing. We're going to give it to them. 
It's possible. If, if, a, if one of my markers brought it to me and they made that argument, I would say that student has demonstrated sufficient working out. We shouldn't punish a student under exam conditions for misreading an angle, right? Um, anyway, I didn't do the trigonometry. I just used my known values. I know that this is 0 0.707. I know the number has to be bigger. This number is bigger than 40. The number the force is going up. We can see that if it's tension, it would be pulling out and down. And because it's going up, it has to be going into the node. If it's going into the node, it's compression. And we're done.